Narcissus in Literature Becky Sharp Vanity Fair is a novel by the English author William Makepeace Thackeray, which follows the lives of Becky Sharp and Amelia Sedley amid their friends and families during and after the Napoleonic Wars. It was first published as a 19-volume monthly serial, the last containing parts 19 and 20, from 1847 to 1848, carrying the subtitle Pen and Pencil Sketches of English Society, which reflects both its satirization of early 19th century British society and the many illustrations drawn by Thackeray to accompany the text. It was published as a single volume in 1848, with the subtitle A Novel Without a Hero, reflecting Thackeray's interest in deconstructing his era's conventions regarding literary heroism. It is sometimes considered the principal founder of the Victorian domestic novel. The story is framed as a puppet play, and the narrator, despite being an authorial voice, is somewhat unreliable. The serial was a popular and critical success, the novel is now considered a classic and has inspired several audio, film and television adaptations. It also inspired the title of the British Lifestyle magazine, first published in 1868, which became known for its caricatures of famous people of Victorian and Edwardian society. Rebecca Sharp, called Becky, is an intelligent young woman with a gift for satire. She is described as a short, sandy-haired girl who has green eyes and a great deal of wit. Becky is born to a French opera dancer mother and an art teacher and artist father, Francis. Fluent in both French and English, Becky has a beautiful singing voice, plays the piano, and shows great talent as an actress. Without a mother to guide her into marriage, Becky resolves that I must be my own mamma. She therefore appears to be completely amoral and without conscience, and has been called the work's anti-heroine. She does not seem to have the ability to get attached to other people, and lies easily and intelligently to get her way. She is extremely manipulative. And after the first few chapters and her failure to attract Joss Sedley, is not shown as being particularly sincere. Never having known financial or social security even as a child, lack of control environment, Becky desires it above all things. Nearly everything she does is with the intention of securing a stable position for herself, assertion of control, and her husband, extension of self, after she and Rawdon are married. She advances Rawdon's interests tirelessly, flirting with men such as General Tufto and the Marquis of Steyne to get him promoted. Extension of self, residual benefit, flirtation, lack of boundary recognition. She also used her feminine wiles, manipulation, to distract men at card parties while Rawdon cheats them blind. blind. Conspiracy to defraud, in effect. Marrying Rawdon Crawley in secret was a mistake, as was running off instead of begging Miss Crawley's forgiveness. She also fails to manipulate Miss Crawley though Rawdon, so as, through Rawdon so as to obtain an inheritance. Although Becky manipulates men very easily, she is less successful with women. She is utterly hostile to Lady Bearacres, dismissive of Mrs. O'Dowd and Lady Jane, although initially friendly, initially distrusts and dislikes her. Child of a poor artist and a French opera girl, Becky Sharp early learns to shift for herself. Her mother dead, Becky's father with a great propensity for running into debt and a partiality for the tavern, brings her up, a lack of control environment. From her mother she has a knowledge of French, from her father the ability to ward off creditors. With this heritage of bohemian blood and a clever mind, Becky lives by her wits. At her father's death, two bailiffs quarrel over his corpse, Becky is accepted at Miss Pinkerton's to teach French in exchange for schooling, free board and room, and a little money. Ingenious Rebecca manufactures a laudable ancestry for herself, revision of history, and although she is at heart selfish and hostile, she demonstrates at times good humour. When she cares, false compassion for the rich Miss Crawley, who has £70,000, Rebecca's 
little nerves seemed to be of iron, and she was quite unshaken by the duty and tedium of the sick chamber. That might perhaps hint at some form of psychopathic tendency that she's unruffled by that which she saw around her. In addition to her mental endowment, Rebecca has physical charm, described by Dr. Squills as green eyes, fair skin, pretty figure, famous frontal development. Mrs. Bute Crawley laments Rebecca's physical attraction when she looks at her own dumpy, misshapen, blue-blooded daughters. Becky has one determination, to carve out a place for herself in Vanity Fair. Although she hasn't blushed naturally since she was eight years old, which might suggest that that was the critical point at which she made the transition to narcissism, she can blush at will, acting manipulative. She exploits her aloneness and lack of protection. She can cry when she wants to, pity play, but the most genuine tears she sheds are those when she, then she has to refuse marriage to the wealthy Sir Pitt Crawley, undoubtedly crying for herself as a consequence of not being able to execute the marriage. And she can't marry him because she's already married his son, Rawdon. When she and Rawdon are living on nothing a year, Rebecca deals with the creditors. It is she who starts the rumour that Rawdon has inherited from his rich aunt, Lies, and thereby gets out of Paris without paying any debts, lack of accountability, since she has ordered a newly decorated apartment against her return. It is she who settles for a percentage of Rawdon's debts in England, so that he may return to London for a fresh start. Among Rebecca's talents are music, both piano and voice, she can sketch, talk French like a native, dance, act, mimic. Notably, those last two factors are very useful as a consequence of arising from her narcissism. Not only her physical charm attracts Lord Stain, but her wit and mimicry and her ability to get money out of him, even when he realises she is outwitting him. That demonstrates a sense of entitlement and lack of accountability, along with an absence of emotional empathy. The more money she wheedles out of him, the more amused he is until the fatal day when Rawdon walks in on the two of them. Rebecca's ambition is her outstanding characteristic. She sacrifices husband, child, friends to it, demonstrating lack of emotional empathy and lack of accountability. In a letter to Amelia after Becky has gone to Queen's Crawley, she says, At least I shall be amongst gentle folks, and not with vulgar city people. Contempt, haughtiness. This jibe refers to both the Sedleys and the Osbournes, because George has thwarted her marriage with Joseph Sedley. She continues, You might lodge all the people in Russell Square in the house, I think, and have space to spare. Although Rebecca is a merciless social climber, has abandoned her child, absence of emotional empathy and accountability, whom she hates, has destroyed Rawdon and will destroy Joseph, yet it is she who brings Amelia to her senses and who realises the one true gentleman in the whole of Vanity Fair is Dobbin. After eavesdropping on William's talk with Amelia, Becky says to herself, What a noble heart that man has, and how shamefully that woman plays with it. This isn't actually any demonstration of goodness of Becky Sharp, but once again demonstrates the hypocritical behaviours and the contrariness of the narcissist, whereby the narcissist can recognise traits in other people, even though they won't necessarily see it themselves, and the fact that they can criticise somebody else for the behaviours that they engage in themselves. For instance, she describes him as having a noble heart and how shamefully that woman plays with it, yet this is what Becky Sharp does with countless men, yet she doesn't see anything wrong in her doing it, but is able to criticise others for behaving in a way that's similar to her. She determines to help William's cause with Amelia, and Thackeray explains why Becky does what she does. She was of a wild, roving nature, inherited from father and mother, lack of control environment, genetic predisposition towards narcissism, who were both bohemians by taste and circumstance. Of course, here, the concept of narcissism isn't spoken about, but the bohemian nature is another way of describing the way that they behaved particularly with regard to being viewed as narcissists. Becky succeeds in establishing herself in Vanity Fair at the cost of the lives of two men and the alienation of all her friends and family. 
Rebecca represents the adventurous who looks for fame and fortune, which, of course, are residual benefits of the narcissist. With striking speed, she soon grows to realise that what the novel is essentially endorsing is that society is fundamentally Darwinian in its operation. Capital domination resides with a powerful patriarchy. The stronger or more adaptable animals survive at the expense of the weaker. There is a glaring chasm between the haves and haves not. This being the case, the burning question for Becky is how, as a social orphan without obvious credentials, she will survive in an unwelcoming world. Becky is presented in a very negative view. She's presented as one of the most selfish figures in the novel. Selfishness, of course, being a narcissistic trait and a key operating factor of the narcissist. The difference between social classes is an important topic in Vanity Fair. The Victorian era was characterised by considerable industrial growth, which created a generation of rich people. These individuals were known as the new gentry. There was a very large discrepancy between the poor and the rich, and then in between there were several intermediate classes. In Vanity Fair, Thackeray gives an insight into how the more powerful circles look to distinguish themselves from those who are seen as the common people. Thackeray emphasises the importance of pedigree in this world full of vanities. Birth and fortune are means by which one can distinguish oneself from the ordinary individuals. This is particularly important with regard to Rebecca Sharp, for there is nothing more important in life. She was driven by her overriding ambition to pursue status and wealth, which of course for a narcissist is hugely important as they are means by which control can be asserted, fuel can be drawn. Sharp was born into one of the lowest social classes. Her parents were impoverished artists and their professions were not considered respectable. Her father was an artist who gave drawing lessons at Miss Pinkerton's Academy. He's described as a disillusioned individual who likes the liquor. Apparently he was a clever man, a pleasant companion, a careless student, but had a great propensity for running into debt and partiality for the tavern. When he was drunk, he would beat his wife and daughter, and the next morning, with a headache, he would rail at the world for its neglect of his genius. There certainly seems to be quite a degree of entitlement and lack of accountability and absence of emotional empathy from her father, and this may well be the breeding ground for her narcissism. Her mother was a French opera girl who had received some education somewhere. Her profession was associated with moral corruption and contrasted sharply with the ideal image to which women were expected to live up to. Despite the fact that her mother practised a confession, a profession rather unworthy of a lady, Becky Sharp only referred to her as the descendant of a prominent family. Revision of History Rebecca deliberately withheld the details about her mother's disreputable profession because his exposure would degrade her even more. Threat to control. Facade management. She would be considered immoral, and this would make it quite impossible for her to rise into society. When her mother died, her father begged Miss Pinkerton to take care of Becky if anything should happen to him. When Rebecca's father died as well, Miss Pinkerton took the girl into her school, but only because she could gain by it. Rebecca spoke French with a purity and a Parisian accent, a rare quality in those days, and the main reason for her stay at Chiswick Mal. She became an articled pupil, teaching young ladies French. It was in this academy that Rebecca was confronted with young ladies born into high society, and it became clear to her that she was treated as a lesser person, threat to control, and she realised that her situation did not look very good. She was a penniless orphan in a society which judged its inhabitants by their income. Envious as she was, Rebecca felt as if injustice was done to her victim mentality. Many of those wealthy girls did not possess half the qualities and skills she did. Now, that may be correct, 
which shows a high degree of pride on her part, or that she may not have possessed those skills but thought that she did, which demonstrates delusion. Nevertheless, those other girls were treated as ladies, and she was not. Thus, she exhibited envy. She felt wronged, but was strong-willed and determined to claim a position where she would receive everyone's admiration. Naturally, admiration being of particular importance as a form of fuel for a narcissist. The happiness, the superior advantages of the young women around her, gave Rebecca inexpressible pangs of envy. What airs that girl gives herself because she's an earl's granddaughter, she said of one. How they cringe and bow to that creole just because of her hundred thousand pounds. I am a thousand times cleverer, conceit, grandiosity, and more charming than that creature for all her wealth. I am as well-bred as the earl's granddaughter for all her fine pedigree, and yet everyone passes me by here. And yet, when I was at my father's, did not the men give up their gayest balls and parties in order to pass the evening with me? This was the start of Rebecca's striving for status. The only option for her to become a member of the upper class was to marry someone with money. Residual benefit. She knew that this would not be an easy task since she had no money at all and came from a disreputable family. Her attempts to rise into society were hampered by social rank. She lacked the features which would enable her to enter society. She had neither money nor reputation. It's also the case that Becky Sharp never let a chance go by to emphasise how unfortunate she really is. Self-pity, pity play. Her feigned self-pity contributes to the underestimation of her personality. She feels that she has every quality to become a lady, but she lacks those things which one cannot practice. She will carry her unfortunate birth with her, for the rest of her life. Despite the fact that Becky is considered inferior to Amelia, particularly with regard to class and descent, she has other qualities which Amelia lacks. Sharp has a strong personality. Her self-awareness and ability to measure people make it possible for her to make herself as desirable as Amelia. Throughout the novel, these two women take turns in being each other's superior. Rebecca is determined to overrule Amelia, naturally, to nullify the threat to control that she poses. I have nothing to look for but what my own labour can bring me. And, while that little pink-faced chit Amelia, with not half my sense as £10,000 and an establishment secure, poor Rebecca, and my figure is far better than hers, pride, contempt, has only herself and her own wits to trust to. Well, let us see if my wits cannot provide me with an honourable maintenance, and if some day or the other I cannot show Miss Amelia my real superiority over her. Not that I dislike poor Amelia, hypocrisy. Who can dislike such a harmless, good-natured creature? Condescending. Only it will be a fine day when I can take my place. Becky Sharp is a clever and intelligent woman. She is aware of her manipulative abilities and is not afraid to use them. Already as a little girl she exercised these powers to help her father. Many had done had she talked to and turned away from her father's door. Rebecca knows how to flatter people into liking her manipulation. She senses accurately how people want her to behave. So she has that intuitive awareness of being able to morph into what people expect of her. She is a fantastic actress who has little difficulty in convincing her audience of her sincerity. Thackeray mentions in his preface, Before the Curtain, that the famous little Becky puppet has been pronounced to be uncommonly flexible in the joints. In other words, she knows how to manipulate people and does her utmost best to gain everyone's favour, because by doing so she can control them and draw fuel from them. More than once, Rebecca is referred to as a snake. I, says Miss Pinkerton, have nourished a viper. Had she coaxed and wheeled into good humour, and into the granting of one wheel more. Lively on the wire in my bosom may well refer to the snake in the Garden of Eden who cajoled Eve into disobedience. The snake cannot force Eve into temptation by strength. It has to rely on its forked tongue to overpower its victim. The same is true of Rebecca Sharp. She can't force her way into society, lacking the fortune and reputation which is considered necessary, and therefore she must manipulate her way in. Her charms and her ability to entertain make her popular with men, who are, of course, her target audience. 
Victorian society was dominated by men. Women belonged to the domestic sphere and had little or no political significance. Since her intention was to change her position in a male-dominated society, she naturally needed to impress and flatter men. She is described as she writhes and twists about like a snake, which of course makes her unpopular with women who consider her a temptress and a rival. The victims found sexually attractive women inherently threatening because they represented a powerful force that men could not resist or control. This idea had its origins in the book of Genesis when Adam fell victim to Eve's temptations. Women could supposedly wield these terrible powers over men through their beauty, so a physically frail woman would probably be seen as less aggressive, therefore less threatening and the preferable type. Rebecca Sharp makes herself attractive by being lively and keen, and thus sets herself apart from her rival Amelia, who is an excellent example of the frail and less aggressive woman. Becky has a lot of influence on the men who surround her. There are numerous examples of men who were swept off their feet by this little woman. Infatuation. Not all attempts are fruitful, but Rebecca considers her numerous flirtations as practice. Eventually, Rebecca gets married, but when her marriage proves to be a disappointment, not bringing her the financial improvement she had expected, residual benefit, she resumes making courtesies to men who can sponsor her, showing, of course, the shallow nature of the way that she is. In fact, her marriage never stops her from flirting, lack of emotional empathy, lack of boundary recognition, because she feels the repeated need to improve her situation. Becky soon discovers that she can overpower men and use them to advance herself in life. For example, there is the Reverend Mr. Crisp, the curate to the Vicar of Chiswick at Miss Tinkerton's Academy. He falls in love with Rebecca and proposes to marry her, but the swift interference of his mamma prevents it. Becky claims to be innocent and protests that she had never exchanged a single word with Mr. Crisp, except under her Miss Pinkerton's own eyes on the two occasions when she had met him at tea. This, of course, again, is her feigning in innocence. Miss Sharp's ultimate victim is Amelia's brother, Joseph. Tamika Jones unfolds Rebecca's plan to conquer his heart. In her view, the methodical steps she takes to execute the plan and the difficult manoeuvring of ensnaring Joseph read like a Cosmopolitan magazine article on how to trap a husband in ten days and establish the mode of operation she employs throughout the novel. According to Jones, four major steps can be distinguished. First, Rebecca appears to be humble and virginal and shows interest in Joseph's profession, feigned interest. Secondly, she convinces everyone of her good sense of humour, duping. Thirdly, she tries to appear cool and uninterested. And last, she wins over his family and friends along with the household help. It's true that she repeatedly makes use of these steps in her attempts to seduce men and to climb the social ladder. Despite all her efforts, Rebecca has the misfortune that Joseph was dissuaded by George Osborne, Amelia's fiancé and a terrible snob. It is striking that George Osborne, who initially despises the little governess, becomes infatuated by her as well. He is so easily attracted by fame and fortune that he is overwhelmed by Rebecca once she obtains popularity and walks among the more genteel. He flirts with her and even proposes to elope together, being convinced that the wife Rebecca was dying of love for. He thought her gay, brisk, arch, delightful. Demonstrating the power that Becky Sharp wields, and she knows it also. In her conquest of the Crawley family, Rebecca uses the same tactics as with Joseph Sedley. She makes herself agreeable to everyone in the house, thus winning everybody over. I must be my own mamma, said Rebecca, not without a tingling consciousness of defeat, as she thought over her little misadventure with Joss Sedley. So she widely determined to render her position with the Queen's Crawley family comfortable and secure, and to this end resolved to make friends of everyone around her who could become friends. Thus she does so purely in order to manipulate people to get what she wants. There's no genuine friendship whatsoever. Becky is tolerant to her pupils. With Mr Crawley, Miss Sharp was respectful and obedient, and she makes herself useful to the baronet in many ways. At Queen's, Crawley, she has many admirers. In a letter to Amelia, Rebecca makes clear that she's proposed to by the doctor, and that her employer is keen on her as well, all good fuel for her. The young doctor gave a certain friend of yours to understand 
that if she chose to be Mrs. Glauber, she was welcome to ornament the surgery. I told his impudence that the gilt pestle and mortar was quite ornament enough, as if I was born indeed to be a country surgeon's wife. Thus, dismissiveness and haughtiness. This extract demonstrates how Rebecca is not satisfied with a marriage proposal by a common surgeon. She would achieve little admiration by marrying him, so she awaits a more fruitful proposal. To her, marriage is simply a device to get what she requires. Now, it is important to mind, remind oneself of the societal circumstances whereby women were very much disadvantaged compared to men, and therefore it was often in their interests, of course, to marry somebody of station and of wealth and of status. However, when it comes to Becky Sharp, we see a much more manipulative approach, whereby an individual would look to better themselves through marriage, but also would believe in the concept of love. Love is not something that ever crosses Becky Sharp's mind, because she's incapable of giving it. All she is focused upon is the pursuit of those prime aims. The most important admirer belonging to the Crawley family is Rawdon Crawley, Sir Pitt's youngest son. He's a true dandy with a fondness for gambling and swearing who lives under the protection of Miss Crawley. He is overwhelmed by Rebecca's intelligence and her initial reluctance to respond to his flirtation. When he wrote her a note for the first time, she threw it into the fire and referred to it as a false note. Invalidation. Rawdon, who is to inherit the largest part of his aunt's fortune, is of course an ideal match for Rebecca. The fact that he took a liking into her makes it easy for Becky to win him over. Eventually, they get married in secret, out of fear of losing the inheritance. Despite Miss Crawley's pronounced liberal views, she turns out to be a true Victorian socialite, with traditional opinions on the matter. Although she proclaims Rebecca as her equal and, a, and as a fit candidate to become Lady Crawley, she is horrified by Becky's marriage with Rawdon and has several fits of hysterics. Initially, Rebecca's marriage with Rawdon seems to work. They are alike in their abilities to exploit others. Rebecca entertains men while Rawdon empties their pockets through all sorts of gambling. Initially, her husband helps her exploit others because it provides them with an income. Lack of emotional empathy, sense of entitlement. But when Rawdon can be of no more use to his wife, Rawdon starts to work, Rebecca starts to work on her own, no longer involving her husband in her plans, once again demonstrating the way that she simply uses people as appliances. Rawdon's disinheritance causes Rebecca to continue her search for wealth and prestige and leads her to her attachment with Lord Steen. Rebecca wants to make her way among the highest circles of society and therefore she needs to be on good terms with Lord Steen, a very rich aristocrat. She entertains him and other important men at her house. He becomes very fond of her and expresses it by helping her in a conquest of the more genteel people. He's very aware that Becky uses him to get into society, but he allows her to. Well, said the old gentleman, twiddling around his wife's card, you are bent on becoming a fine lady. You pester my poor old life out to get you into the world. You won't be able to hold your own there, you silly little fool. You've got no money. You will get us a place, interposed Becky, as quick as possible. You've got no money and you want to compete with those who have... You poor little earthenware pipkin, you want to swim down the stream along with the great copper kettles. All women are alike. Rebecca receives jewels and a large sum of money from Lord Steen, residual benefits, and in turn he has the opportunity to spend a lot of time with Becky. The purpose of the sum of money that Rebecca had received is to redeem the borrowed capital of Miss Briggs, who is Becky's companion. Of course, she doesn't settle her debts, she keeps most of the money to herself and simply buys Honest Briggs, who is unaware of the arrangement between Rebecca and Lord Steen, and buys her a new dress to keep her satisfied. Nevertheless, the aristocrat finds out what Rebecca has done and admires her even more. Of course, such reactions just encourage Rebecca Sharp as validating that she's doing the right thing. His lordship's admiration for Becky rose immeasurably at this proof of her cleverness. Getting the money was nothing, but getting double the sum she wanted and paying nobody, it was a magnificent stroke. The correspondence between Rebecca and Lord Steen is broken off abruptly when Rawdon walked in on the two and suspected them of adultery. Lack of emotional empathy, lack of boundary recognition. Thackeray doesn't actually clarify whether this event actually occurred, and 
whether it means the end of Becky's relationship with both her husband and, of course, Lord Steen. Both of them are infatuated with her, once again, the wiles of the narcissist, but neither of them can live with the thought of having to share her with the other. At this point, Rebecca's manipulative abilities prove to be of no use directly. She cannot secure her position in society when such a scandal pursues her. In an attempt to confine the damage, she flees to the continent, assertion of control through withdrawal, where she tries to start all over again. A typical move of the narcissist, where, in some instances, they blow their cover amongst a particular strata of society, uh, stratum of society, or within a, a group or within a town, and therefore are forced to go elsewhere and seek out fresh victims. She uses her manipulative abilities to gain access to certain people, but she finds that things have changed. The women avoid and insult her. Interestingly, in the entire novel, there's only one man who isn't deceived by the flattery that Rebecca Sharp uses regularly and actually sees her for what she is, Dobbin. He's a paragon of virtue in the novel, and he dislikes Rebecca immensely. What a humbug that woman is, honest old Dobbin mumbled to George when he came back from Rebecca's box, whither he had conducted her in perfect silence and with a countenance as glum as an undertaker's. Interestingly, of course, he in effect was grey rocking. She writhes and twists about like a snake all the time she was here. Didn't you see, George, how she was acting at the general over the way? Dobbin values kindness and sincerity, two characteristics which Rebecca Sharp only feigns. Dobbin senses that this woman is pretending to be somebody else, and he's entirely correct, and therefore he is suspicious of her. The other thing which determines his disgust for Becky is his love for Amelia. He adores her with all his heart, and Rebecca's struggle to become Amelia's superior does not make her popular with him. She did not like him and feared him privately, nor was he very much prepossessed in her favour. He was so honest that her arts and cajoleries did not affect him, and he shrank from her with instinctive repulsion. Thus her attempts to manipulate him founded on his honesty. And as she was by no means so far superior to her sex as to be above jealousy, she disliked him the more for his adoration of Amelia, once again demonstrating how the narcissist cannot stand for people's attention to go elsewhere. In a way, it can be said that Rebecca Sharp has a lot in common with the character of the femme fatale. This, of course, is somebody who uses their sexuality, a common behaviour of the narcissist or other feminine skills, to overwhelm and tempt men in order to achieve an objective. She considers herself superior to men in general grandiosity because she believes they cannot outrun their sexual desire for her, magical thinking, believing that every man wants her. Lord Steen was her slave. He followed her everywhere and scarcely spoke to anyone in the room besides and paid her the most marked compliments and attention. The ladies at the other tables, who supped off mere silver and marked Lord Steen's constant attention to her, vowed it was a monstrous infatuation, a gross insult to ladies of rank. It demonstrates the power that she has, the spell that she cast over him. Thackeray also refers to Rebecca as a siren, a creature which entices sailors through her singing in order to let their ship founder against the cliffs and become wrecked. They look pretty enough when they sit upon a rock, playing on their harps and combing their hair and sing and beckoning to you to come and hold the looking glass. But when they sing into their native element, depend on it, those mermaids are about no good, and we had best not examine the fiendish marine cannibals, revelling and feasting on their victims. This image of her sheds light upon her dark side, on her capacity, in effect, to perform evil. In a way, Thackeray announces Becky's slyness in advance by giving her the name Sharp. The name is used to describe her biting, discerning and cunning personality. The traits support the image as Rebecca as the artful siren, i.e., another manifestation of her narcissism. In Victorian society, women were judged on their virtue and innocence. A woman's chastity was her highest concern. Without it, she was lost. As a result, Victorian women tried to live up to this prescribed ideal. There is an issue in Vanity Fair as to whether or not Rebecca commits adultery, in particular with Lord Steen. Her behaviour towards men proves that she is no model of virtue and innocence. But the narrator never explicitly states that Rebecca cheats on her husband. Nevertheless, remarks are made on the inappropriateness of the matter, especially when her intimacy with Lord Steen increases. 
The narrator also allows the characters to express their opinion on her behaviour, which gives him the opportunity to delay the sharing of his perspective on Rebecca's affairs with his audience. You may well have expected the narrator to clarify if Sharp committed adultery or not, yet he let the audience decide for themselves. There are various insights, however, given so that people can draw their conclusions. For instance, the first is expressed by the servant's opinion of her by describing her flirtatious behaviour. They state, and so, guiltless very likely, she was writhing and pushing onward towards what they call a person in society, and the servants were pointing at her as lost and ruined. Sir Pitt observes, spoke of the honour of the family, the unsullied reputation of the Crawleys, expressed himself in an indignant tones about her receiving those young Frenchmen, those wild young, women, young men of fashion, my Lord Steen himself, whose carriage was always at her door, who passed hours daily in her company, and whose constant presence made the world talk about her. As the head of the house, he implored her to be more prudent. Society was already speaking lightly of her. Lord Steen, though a nobleman of the greatest station and talents, was a man whose attentions would compromise any woman. He besought, he implored, he commanded his sister-in-law to be watchful in her intercourse with that nobleman. And then Rawdon's colleagues expressed their views. It's about about my wife, Crawley answered, casting down his eyes and turning very red. The other gave a whistle. I always said she'd throw you over, he began. Indeed, there were bets in the regiment, and at the clubs regarding the probable fate of Colonel Crawley, so lightly was his wife's character esteemed by his comrades in the world. But seeing the savage look with which Rawdon answered the expression of this opinion, McMurdo did not think it fit to enlarge upon it further. These lines demonstrate that the servants consider Rebecca a fallen woman, i.e. one who has been unfaithful. Her brother-in-law is alarmed as well, but doesn't necessarily believe her to be quite yet ruined. But he does notice the signs which announce her downfall, as do Rawdon's colleagues. All these interpretations contribute to the construction of her character, suggesting that adultery took place, which of course is something that a narcissist would regularly engage in as a consequence of having no emotional empathy for the spouse, acting with a sense of entitlement, and using sex as a means to control other people. Rebecca naturally, through denial, maintains throughout that she's innocent. I am innocent, Rawdon, she said. Before God, I am innocent. She clung hold of his coat, of his hands. Her own were all covered with serpents and rings and baubles. Lord Steen's reply, however, gives the readers the impression that Becky was anything but innocent. "'You, innocent! Damn you!' he screamed out. "'You, innocent! Why, every trinket you have on your body is paid for by me. I have given you thousands of pounds which this fellow has spent and for which he has sold you.' He describes her as a prostitute, saying that Rawdon sold her and making use of the term bully— which would be interpreted at the time as meaning someone who lives upon the gains of a prostitute. Thackeray portrays a society in which appearance is the greatest importance. People try to create the illusion of perfect happiness and financial comfort, to be considered a respected member of society, or simply to arouse envy in one's neighbour, which, of course, is a narcissistic environment in itself and one that a narcissist would gladly play into. I suppose there is no man in this vanity fair of ours so little observant as not to think sometimes about the worldly affairs of his acquaintances, or so extremely charitable as not to wonder how his neighbour Jones or his neighbour Smith can make both ends meet. Becky Sharp is the greatest impostor in Vanity Fair, constantly pretending to be something she's not, typical behaviour of a narcissist. Her entire quest for reputation and wealth is built on pretenses, she pretends to be a descendant from a prominent French family, revision of history. She claims to be virtuous and innocent, facade management. She pretends to be a good mother, facade management, to be in love, duping and manipulation. In short, she pretends to be long, which is what many narcissists do. However, a person in her position will never amount to much by pretense alone. If she wants to really establish the illusion to belong to the higher classes of society, she needed access to the residual benefit of money. Rebecca knows this, and is always searching for a sponsor. As a result, she becomes skilled in the exploitation of others. Her behaviour, of course, towards them being determined by her entire self-centredness. Anyone amusing she enjoys, anyone useful she coaxes. Others she certainly needs, but as we need luxuries that give piquancy to life, 
not as necessities without which we die. She does all that she can to be liked, for to be liked is fun and profit, and of course enables her to gain control over people and drink of their fuel. She seeks friends to serve her own ends, to show off her charm and wit, utilising them as appliances. She shows no signs of remorse or scruples when she exploits people who are less fortunate than she is. She has a negative image. She's she is depicted as a parasite, which lives from its host until the host can be of no more use, the typical behaviour of a narcissist. Throughout the novel, Rebecca takes advantage of many people, the most important ones being Miss Crawley, Lord Steen, Sir Pitt, and last but not least, Joseph Sedley. Her ultimate act of exploitation is directed at Joseph. He becomes Rebecca's sponsor and last resort at the end of the novel. She lives a degraded life among dubious figures after her flight from England. Joseph, or rather his money, residual benefit, is Rebecca's ticket back to a more respectable way of living. Rebecca cannot lay hands upon his fortune through marriage, since she is already married, and as a result, she has to come up with another plan. Thackeray never expands on what Rebecca exactly does, but he simply describes that Rebecca inherits a large sum from Mr. Sedley, who died under suspicious circumstances. Thackeray fails to clarify whether Rebecca is guilty of murder or not, but he does provide the reader with information that suggests that she had something to do with his death. The solicitor of the insurance company swore it was the blackest case that had ever come before him, talking of sending a commission to X to examine into the death, and the company refused payment of the policy. But Mrs, or Lady Crawley as she styled herself, came to town at once, attended with her solicitors, Messrs Burke, Thirtwell and Hayes of Thavies Inn, and dared the company to refuse the payment. Assertion of control to nullify a threat to control. Interestingly, the names of Rebecca's solicitors may also serve as a hint towards her involvement in the death of Sedley, since the names of the solicitors are those of notorious murderers of the time. Nevertheless, Rebecca is restored in society, the money was paid, and her character established. This sentence demonstrates that in Vanity Fair, wealth is preferred over sincerity and morality. Money can pardon any kind of behaviour, which is precisely the mindset of the narcissist. Rebecca Sharp deviates, in many ways, from the stereotypical Victorian wife. One of the most striking differences is the fact that she has little or no maternal instinct, absence of emotional empathy. She does not care much for her son. She considers him as an impediment in her conquest of reputation, for how can a mother figure be attractive and successful in her capture of prominent men? Thus, she puts her own needs before that of her child, again, a common behaviour of the narcissist. It has already been said that Rebecca knew very well that she had to overpower men if she wanted to improve her situation. In Victorian society, women were seen as domestic figures, and if Rebecca had only directed her attempts to enter society at them, it would have brought little change. The narrator refers to Rawdon Jr.'s birth in very few words, which indicates that it is not considered a very special or emotional event conveying the views of Rebecca. In the early spring of 1816, Galignani's journal contained the following announcement. The boy is neither loved nor looked after by his mother. She always leaves him under the care of others. When she left Paris to make a short visit to England, she had, him placed, she had placed him out at a nurse in a village in the neighbourhood of Paris's care of by the servants. About the little Rawdon, if nothing has been said all this while, it is because he is hidden upstairs in a garret somewhere, or has crawled below into the kitchen for companionship. His mother scarcely even took notice of him. He passed the days with his French bon as long as that domestic remained in Mr Crawley's family, and when the French woman went away, the little fellow, howling in the loneliness of the night, had compassion taken on him by a housemaid, who took him out of his solitary nursery. Rebecca's neglect of her infant is the ultimate evidence of her self-centeredness and her narcissism. She prefers the pursuit of her own ambition to the well-being of her child, thus placing her needs ahead of that of the child. The boy himself is completely estranged from his mother. She was an unearthly being in his eyes, superior to his father, to all the world, 
to be worshipped and admired at a distance. To drive with that lady in the carriage was an awful right. He sat up in the back seat and did not dare to speak. He gazed with all his eyes at the beautifully dressed princess opposite to him. O oh, thou poor lonely little benighted boy! This mean characteristic is one of the key elements in Thackeray's attempt to portray Rebecca as someone who is unable to feel affection for anybody else. It also reinforces the image of her as an adventuress who is concerned with the worldly sphere. Her character serves as the ultimate example of the corrupted individual. She's the most selfish character in Vanity Fair. Her only concern is her own ambition to become a person of distinction, and in order to achieve this aim, she will do anything required. Throughout the novel, one sees her vices and the emphasis on her self-centeredness. She's manipulative and exploits people in her quest for fame and fortune. She's an immoral person. It's suggested that it's highly likely that she committed adultery, which reinforces the image of her as a woman of ill repute. Her disinterest in her son shows her as a very selfish individual. It demonstrates how she prefers the pursuit of her own happiness to the well-being of her child. She is a malicious woman, and this is conveyed in the suggestion that she had something to do with the death of Joseph Sedley, or that she might even be his murderer. Thus, she is presented as an evil but accomplished woman. One cannot but recognise and admire her talents, whereby the means justify the end. She only employs her talents to improve her own position in life, which demonstrates the high level of her selfishness. Becky Sharp is a self-entitled woman with no sense of accountability. She has no emotional empathy for anybody whatsoever, demonstrated in the way that she uses so many people and the way that she neglects her own son. She experiences magical thinking. She's grandiose and haughty. She engages in an array of manipulations, particularly towards men. Her boundary recognition is non-existent. People are a means to an end, and she shows so many different aspects of the narcissistic dynamic that there can be no doubt that she is indeed a narcissist. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.